Shalom to Alan Fagan, CEO of the Orthodox Union. Shalom, Yoni. Nice to see you here in Jerusalem. Nice to be here. So how long are you here? I'm here uh, for about a week already. I'll be here for uh, another few days. And it's summer. We met, of course, at the Yom NCSY. You're what? You're running between camp and program and, 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 and seeing all the guys and girls? I'm trying desperately to see as many of our programs that are running here this summer as I can possibly see in 10 days and it's an impossible task. So you're, you're above all this program, but I believe that when you're meeting them, it's, it's them teaching you, them inspiring you, right? When you see these young boys and girls all full of energy and, and ideals. It's enough to keep you going for the entire year. Wow, how do you define the, the main goals? Of, first of all, let's talk about what we're doing here, the summer programs, bringing them to Israel, so many ideals. What, is the main, what are the main goals? The, the, the main goals across all of our programs are to increase identification with the State of Israel, to increase Jewish identity, to increase Torah learning. Uh, each person, each program in their own way appeals to a different kind of audience. So our job is to see to it that we have a program for everyone in the Jewish community in the United States and Canada that appeals to them, appeals to their particular interests, appeals to their level of observance, that we have something here for everyone and we get them connected to Israel uh, while they're here. No one likes definitions, but uh, try to define to me the spectrum, Orthodox Union, but as you mentioned, different levels of uh, observant uh, Jews coming for these programs? So I, I would say that our programs are designed for the totality of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. We have uh, programs for yeshiva students that are primarily Torah learning programs and they're spending much of their day in a traditional Beit Midrash program. We have a program for teenage boys that has 275 young men who are learning Torah here uh, in Beit Meir. We have a program for young women that is primarily a learning program from young women who are from yeshivot and day schools in the United States. Uh, that program is in, uh, in uh, Beit Shemesh. Uh, and we have a dozen programs for public school kids who are unaffiliated and with virtually no background. Uh, in in uh, in Judaism. So so let's ask a few questions about some of these programs. For example, one may ask, what does it matter where are these guys yeshiva bachrim who are steiging all the throughout twenty four seven learning Torah? What does it matter? Why do you bring them to Israel? How do you look at that extra value of learning Torah, which they do very nicely in their yeshivot in America, but doing it here in Israel? There there are a lot of differences. Uh, one primary difference is. In Torah, Torah, Eretz Israel. Uh, we bring them here. It feels different. Uh, they're able to enjoy uh, Israel while they're here. They go on to Ulim. Our group in the NCSY Kolel left this morning at 5 a.m. for Tzfat, uh, and uh, they'll spend uh, two days in Tzfat and in Tveria as part of their program. Uh, you can only do that here. They'll visit Kivrei Tzadikim uh, while they're there. Uh, so that can only be done here. Um, second, we create an atmosphere of learning Lishma. There are no tests. There are no exams. They're not getting grades at the end of the summer. And so they will sit and come back for a night seder uh, until 11 or 12 o'clock at night because they really just want to enjoy learning. How do you, first of all, sell this amazing program without parents saying, wait a second, don't take my child and bring them back observant? Right. Look, I, I, I think um, there are so many different types of teens and so many different types of parents. And I think many of them recognize that there is something that is missing in their lives. There is a level of spirituality, there is a level of identification with their own Judaism that they haven't had the opportunity to taste. And if you go about that process in a non-judgmental way, 
in a, in a, in a way that encourage, encourages uh, voluntary participation. Nobody is putting a gun to their head and saying, you must. Uh, we have embedded in the NCSY Colel a Machina program with 20 young men uh, with very, very little background uh, who are sitting and learning base measure style learning for six weeks during the summer. I was there yesterday. They are loving it. And they're loving it because no one is pushing them, no one is forcing them. It's a whole world that's opening up to them that they have not had the benefit of. We, we all take it for granted uh, that we had the privilege, the opportunity to grow up in orthodox households and to be exposed to yeshiva education and yeshiva learning our whole lives. They've never had that opportunity. Uh, and when they get the opportunity, they see how rich it is, they see how enjoyable it is, and most of all, they're doing it together with young men, and in the girls' program, young women, who are their peers. They're same age, with the same interests, wearing the same clothing, talking about the same things, enjoying the same things, and then in the afternoon they'll go out on the basketball court or the soccer field with the same young people, and they see that this is just all one, one unit, one people, that the differences all begin to break down, and, and that's how I think you can overcome those barriers. Okay, let's get on a plane, go fly back uh, to North America, and talk about really what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And when we hear Orthodox Union, we think OU, we think about the Kashrut, that's like an autopilot already, I would uh, imagine. But tell us really about how huge and humongous this project is of Kashrut, of OU Orthodox Union Kashrut. Uh, Kashrut is obviously an enormously important part of what we do and, and uh, much of what people associate with the Orthodox Union. It's an enormous service to North American uh, Jewry. Uh, we now certify somewhere in the vicinity of one million products and ingredients all over the world. Uh, somewhere between, depending on the year, between 80 and 100 countries in which we have kashrut operations certifying ingredients and products all across the globe. Uh, in something like 10,000 plants. It could be from the, the, the big companies and to the small sandwich that you see at a, you know, at a gas station. How, how's that done? There are some companies that we certify uh, that don't produce product. They produce ingredients. Mm. Uh, they'll produce a spice that's going into a cookie. They'll produce a chemical that's going into some food product. So if you take a major company that's producing a wide range of food products, they may have 20 or 30 different ingredients in every one of their 100 different products. So we're talking at the end of the day about thousands of products. In order for them to be certified, every one of their suppliers needs to be certified. So on any given day, we will have mashkichim, mashkichim out at some remote, remote location somewhere three days from a city in India or in China or in South America. Uh, unbelievable, Mesiras Nefesh, uh, for these mashgichim to go out literally across the globe to be certifying every one of these products and ingredients that's literally coming from every corner of the globe. Let's talk about another one of the big challenges that uh, the Orthodox Union is uh, dealing with, and that's the the price of learning, of learning in Shivot, of learning in Orthodox uh, institutions. What can be done? I mean, we see what happens in Israel, also a big challenge. In terms of uh, in America, what can be done and what are you doing? The major difference uh, is that most education in Israel is public and is supported by the government. Uh, in the United States, there are public schools uh, that by definition cannot get involved in religious uh, teaching and religious activity. And so all of the yeshivot and day schools are private. Uh, and that's the enormous challenge for parents. Uh, in the United States, yeshiva education can cost anywhere between fifteen and forty thousand dollars per child per year. So it's not unusual for an Orthodox family of four before their child ever gets to college to have spent a million dollars on their education 
before they step foot into a college classroom. That's an extraordinary burden on parents. Uh, extraordinary burden. What we have been fighting for uh, now for the past several years, and, and with some reasonable degree of success, is to try to encourage state support for private education. A bit like what we see in Israel to some of the institutions that are on full support, but they're recognized and they get some sort of support from the state. And they'll get some support mm -hmm. from the state. Uh, that support is starting to get to very, very meaningful uh, numbers. In New York State, for example, uh, where we have extensive advocacy operations, New York State is now providing close to $300 million a year of support for non-public education for private schools, including Yeshivot and day schools. Two years ago, we were able to get funding from New York State to begin to pay for STEM teachers, science, technology, engineering, math uh, uh, subjects, to get them to pay for those teachers in private schools, including Yeshivot and day schools. If we can get full funding for that, that will be a game changer uh, in New York and elsewhere. We're now seeing uh, New Jersey uh, following suit uh, and providing its own STEM funding program. Not full reimbursement yet, but all of these programs start small and then expand year after year. So in New York, we started with a relatively small amount of money. It doubled the following year and it doubled again the year after that. And so we're hopeful uh, that those kinds of programs will start to reduce this enormous tuition burden uh, on parents and the enormous unfairness uh, of the state subsidizing the education for some children, but not for others. Another financial burden is, of course, the issue of security. First of all, how has that, chal that challenge has changed and worsened? throughout the year, right? It's, it's changed dramatically, certainly uh, 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 given the tragedy in Pittsburgh uh, and the more recent tragedy in Poway uh, in California, it has changed dramatically. Uh, and security has become an enormous focus of every shul in our community. And many of our shuls are very, very small shuls. Uh, but it does mean a security guard for each one, even though even if it's small. And their their membership base is usually reasonably small. Maybe there'll be a shul with 50 families or 75 families. So the notion of paying for a private security guard uh, that stands in front of shul is a huge burden on families. There too, we've been advocating for government funding to provide uh, both security equipment and security and the cost, cover the cost of security personnel uh, in shuls, in schools, in community centers, in daycare centers, and now in the summer, most recently, and this is an enormous, almost under the radar problem in camps, uh, which are wide open. Uh, and that's been a very serious problem. And we have now in the last two years brought hundreds of millions of dollars of government funding purely for security of institutions, including schools and schools. How are you seeing the, the latest tensions or the latest headlines regarding tensions between the parts of the Jewish society and the way they're looking at the Israel this, these days? Yeah, so the, 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 there are enormous tensions. Uh, but the tensions are exacerbated, um, I believe, uh, by the political tensions that exist in the United States. This is not just tensions necessarily between streams. Uh, in the United States, it's interesting because we've got a third of the Jews in the United States don't belong to any stream. They are so far removed uh, from their Judaism that they don't affiliate in any way whatsoever. But there are also significant tensions between right and left. Uh, on the political spectrum. Uh, there are tensions as it relates to views with respect to Israel and its policies. But I think most troubling of, of all of this is that there not only are tensions, but the tensions are becoming more pronounced and less and less civil in the discourse that we're using 
uh, in, in explaining our differences and in talking through our differences. Uh, we're shouting at each other a lot more than talking to one another. Uh, and, and that's a, a, a terrible, terrible problem. I don't think it affects only American Jewry. I think it's becoming a, uh, almost a global phenomenon uh, uh, that we're seeing, that the polarization of positions creates almost a demonization of everyone else who doesn't agree with your position. And, and, and the ability to, to, to talk, uh, to debate, to try to persuade, to share narratives is becoming virtually uh, a thing of the past. And, and that's a terrible, terrible problem. And it affects our community enormously. The other thing that affects the American Jewish community in particular, I think, is a declining sense, particularly among young people, uh, of affiliation with Israel, of emotional attachment to Israel. That's something that we're seeing on campus. We're seeing it in polls uh, that are taken. We're seeing it in political activity. Uh, and, and that, too, is a very, very troubling trend. And assimilation, of course. Assimilation, for sure. Is there an answer? Yeah, Jewish identification. Considering oneself to be Jewish, in, in whatever way that means for wherever you're holding in your journey uh, uh, toward greater Jewish identification, that has meaning for these kids. It's something that many, many of them are striving for and have never had the privilege of of being associated with. Our job is really an educational job. We provide alternatives by teaching. And, and we teach young American Jews that there is a Judaism out there that is beautiful and that they should want to be identified with. And many of them do and, and want to be. The problem that we have is that there's just insufficient support. There's a limit to how many people we can put in the field to run these programs. There's a limit to the number of dollars that we have available. If, if we have 1,700 kids in Israel this summer, we could have 5,000 kids in Israel this summer if we had the funds to be able to do it. Instead of bringing 600 public school kids to Israel, we could bring 6,000. Um, and, and we just don't have the means to be able to do it. We have the desire and we have the staff and we have trained staff to be able to do it. It's just a question of how that relates to the priorities of the funders of the Jewish community. And when we met with the prime minister, this was one of the major issues that we raised with him was that ultimately this has to be part of the obligation of the Israeli government. The Israeli government really wants to attack this problem in the United States and view American Jewry as an important asset, not just of Judaism worldwide, but an important asset for Israel, as a strategic asset for Israel. It needs to invest in the education of the Jewish people in America. Alan Fagan, CEO of Orthodox Union, thank you very much, and come back soon. Thank you very much, Yoni.